This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's episode is sponsored by The Reason Speakeasy, a monthly unscripted conversation in New York City with outspoken defenders of free thinking and heterodoxy. Go to reason.com slash events for information and tickets to the next one. My guest today is Faisal Saeed al Matar, the co-founder of Ideas Beyond Borders, a nonprofit that translates books and articles about limited government, freedom of thought, and market economics into Arabic and other languages, and then distributes them for free in the Middle East and other parts of the world. So full disclosure, I'm on the board of IPB. I talked with Faisal about Ideas Beyond Borders' new book, Untold Stories of the Middle East, which celebrates entrepreneurs in Kurdistan, Afghanistan, and elsewhere whom IBB has given startup grants, how the October 7th attacks on Israel and fighting in Gaza and Lebanon will affect the region for decades, and what it was like to grow up in Baghdad under Saddam Hussein, various Islamic terrorist groups, and the U.S. occupation. This conversation was taped in front of a live audience in New York. Here is the Reason interview with Faisal Saeed al Matar of Ideas Beyond Borders. Faisal, thanks for talking. Thanks for having me. All right, so. Uh, some um, people like me over here. Yeah, some people love you. Um, very quickly, what is Ideas Beyond Borders? So. The mission is to bring a free and a prosperous Middle East. Okay. So and we're a, doing a, it. A pipe dream. Um, it's actually real. And that's yeah. why I think what the, what the book is, is going to represent. And I hope everybody gets a copy and reads it. But really, it's the, the bold vision is to bring a free and prosperous Middle East. And how we actually do it is that we equip people with the knowledge and the skills and the resources for them to take action to make the values of freedom and liberty accessible and actionable. Okay. And well, let's, we're, we're going to go uh, in a little bit, we'll talk more about the origins of IBB. Um, but right now, one of the things we're talking about is a collection, uh, a book that you put out called The Untold Stories of the Middle East, which has to do with a particular initiative that you guys have been funding. Um, tell me about the untold stories of the Middle East. What is it and why did you produce this book? So I'm going to start with the why. And we, we started in 2017, and our first initiative was to really make the ideas of classical liberalism, largely ideas of freedom, available. And slowly, we started getting, we went, we started from zero to million, to two million, to now 8.5 million subscribers in seven years. And as we are spreading these ideas, there were many people who were messaging us, telling us that they want to take an action on these ideas that we are spreading, whether they are people who are following us directly or from the adjacent communities within the larger, I would say, liberal movement within the region. And so we started having conversations with actually some people, Rob and uh, Tyler Cohen from the Mercatus Center and other, about how can we actually build a system that actually supports these initiatives. And we went with a model that is cuts a lot most of the red tape and most of the and making it easier for people to get funding and for them to take the action. And so we started this fund which we call the Innovation Hub, which is really about supporting innovation and, and solutions in the region. And this book is really a collection. We have supported by now roughly 250 startups and 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 even including political parties, etc. And this is like a I don't want to have favoritism because most of them have been great. Some of them were not just kidding. Um, but most of them have been amazing. And this is like a really just a brief of many of the really amazing heroic stories of people fighting for the values of freedom. And it came in, unfortunately in a times of war. Where there is actually so we wanted to like really show that these people still exist and there's still doing the big fights and uh, and there's actually the stories continuing and they're available on our website at ideas beyond borders we publish actually stories of this almost every week so i mean you're talking about you guys give uh, micro grants essentially plus support services to people who are trying to start businesses um, you do a lot of work in Kurdistan. IBB has an office in Kurdistan as well as, what, New York and D.C.? And, uh, and UAE in, and in UAE. Dubai. Okay, so um, tell me about uh, – there's a couple of uh, businesses in Kurdistan that you guys have helped get going. What are they? So, again, I'm, I don't want to put favoritism, but I, but I can tell you one of really inspiration stories. And one of – actually, a business called Kurdwares, uh, which is featured in the book, is that – 
there was ISIS war and there were a lot of Yazidi refugees, a lot of religious minorities who got suffered a lot from ISIS. And what he did with him and some other businesses also featured in the books is that they actually get them jobs. They started a leather company that actually produces not only for the ecosystem around them, but to the worldwide audience, to the diaspora Kurds in Germany and other places. And he needed like really a push, small capital for him to build that system, for him to export overseas. And then he started making lots of revenue that he was able to hire so many people. So like with little money, he was able to actually create so much change. That's one of the ones. The other, the other story that I also like is Lego, uh, which is kind of like Uber, but for women inside the Kurdistan region, but also in Mosul, which is south of Kurdistan region. And there were a lot of, because of cultural differences and women feel unsafe going with a male taxi driver. He was like, you know what? There's a business opportunity here. So actually women could be part of the economy and they can actually go to work, etc. And we supported that business and, and, and really it became very successful. One other one, which I don't think is in the book, but it's still amazing, which is... Uh, of a lot of Afghan refugees and Iranian refugees who live in the Kurdistan region who are uh, building carpets. And carpet industry actually has a high markup and they needed a small change for actually for them to start the business and be able to spread overseas. That's like just some of my favorites, but there's a lot in the book. Um, what is it about the Kurdistan region that um, is, seems to be doing so well when we talk about the, the Middle East and particularly areas that were uh, part of the Iraqi war or, you know, the American invasion and occupation of Iraq, Kurdistan seems to be doing pretty well, um, even though it's not technically its own country, et cetera, or maybe because of that. But can you talk a little bit about why Kurdistan seems to be flourishing? Well, I mean, technically, uh, Kurdistan that featured in the book that we talk about is the semi-autonomous region of Kurdistan, which is part of the Iraq, but it's part, it has this... Uh, it's its own territory, its own parliament, etc. And not to bore you so much with the details, but I would say these are kind of the three key elements. Number one is that the U.S. had a very specific intervention when it comes to the Kurds in 1991 after the war, the first Gulf War, which is like we cannot help a lot, but we can create a no-fly zone to prevent Saddam Hussein from using chemical weapons against that. So it was a very specific mission towards that. The other thing is that the leadership there, which is led by the PDK, sometimes called the KDP, uh, f found out that, that, number one, they don't have a lot of oil. So in order for them to have more independence, there is no better independence than economic independence. So as they started growing, first they actually started with support from the Soviet Union, which is actually a very interesting story. They started first on the left and mostly on the communist left, and that's where you see the split in the Kurds between the PDK and the PKK, which is the Kurdistan Workers' Party, which is actually a recognized terrorist group by the United States and, and Turkey. And the KDP took like the more free enterprise model, which is like, we don't have a lot of oil, so we actually cannot build a fat government that is dependent on heavy salaries. So let's move the country slowly towards privatization. And my organization is actually helping that with the, with the grant and help of Atlas Network for us to push towards that. And then the other thing, so we have the third element, which I think rarely talked about, is that there was a lot of push of secularization within the Kurdish communities over the past decades that actually moved them away from theocratic forces that exist in the rest of the Arab world, or the rest of Arab world in Iraq in particular. So I think these three key elements, which is privatization with, with a dose of secularism, with a dose of independence, it creates the, the, the flourishing that we have. And actually, Scott, who's I think from reason, visited Kurdistan in one of our uh, support in the past couple of months, as I actually went there, I think some of the people here went, is that it's, a, it's, it's I wouldn't say it can be the next Dubai, but you don't actually have to be the next Dubai, but it's definitely, if people can just Google Empire Erbil on Google and you see the new downtown, that is really a significant development of, of, of develop, especially economic development. Uh, one of the other uh, businesses that you talk about is set, it's in Lebanon and it's a jewelry uh, producer. Can you talk about that? So a couple of years, uh, I think three years ago, there was a massive explosion, which I think most people assume it's Hezbollah who did it in Beirut, and it's called the Beirut explosion. And many of the st and businesses, especially small businesses, were destroyed as a result of that explosion. In a, in a government that is amazingly corrupt and divided, as we have seen in Lebanon, many of these businesses have nowhere else to go. So 
because we advertised the existence of the Innovation Hub, they started actually reaching out to us of many of these victims of the Beirut explosion. Uh, sometimes actually- Do we with, it, know what caused the uh, explosion at this point? Or? Um, so there is a lot of theories, which like yeah. if you go to the Middle East, you ask 10 people to get 20 theories. So, right. so um, yeah. I'm gonna, the, the most likely theory is that it was used as a kind of weapons for, for it to store weapons and then something went wrong and-, and uh, and exploded, and so that's I would say the most likely theory. And because of corruption, so many of these startups didn't. They were like they had a lot of amazing stories from jewelry to to clothing. Uh, and Lebanon has always had a great history of of really creating these things. It's been known as used to be called the Paris of the Middle East, but it's always been a place of culture and art and creativity. And I studied English there, so if my English is bad, you should blame Lebanon. Hmm. Um, but it's it's that's where like so there is a lot of these enterprises that were destroyed, unfortunately, and then with with the help of of IBB and help of our donors, we're able to kind of push them to the next level. And Lebanon, I think there is this. Uh, co uh, don't quote me on the statistic, but I think about 60-70% of Lebanese people live actually outside of Lebanon. Significant mm -hmm. part of them live in Latin America. They immigrated in the early uh, early f f 20, 20th century and then some of them moved to the States. So the great things about some of these businesses like the jewelry, etc., they have the ability to connect to the global market. Mm -hmm. So even if the purchasing power or inflation gets, goes up in Lebanon, people in the U.S., the diaspora communities in the U.S., in Michigan, in New York, etc., can purchase and that's what they needed the grant for to some extent. So what, um, you know, one of the knocks on the Middle East is that it is, you know, just one or uh, yeah, well, one. One of the knocks I'm is, the second one. is oh. that um, you know, I mean, there are oil-rich countries, and then you know, when you when you have an economy that's completely built around one commodity, that almost always leads to you know a terrible government, and you know, people not really developing a, a multi-faceted uh, economy. Um, but in the Middle East, a lot of people say there isn't an entre entrepreneurial spirit. Is I mean, is Part of what you're showing in Untold Stories of the Middle East is that is that that's wrong, or is it hard to start businesses there because of the way the government functions? Um, so a lot, and, and actually, the, the good thing about so I've always looked at oil as a curse. So yeah. I, I call it oil as that in a way is that it shifted more countries towards dependency on the government being the supplier of everything. Um, however, some governments, uh, like for example, the government of the United Arab Emirates and the UAE and Saudi Arabia and Qatar to some extent, they've all had built up visions called Vision 2030 or Vision 2040 in some places. And the all idea is to diversify away from oil. So moving the country more towards privatization and also kind of spreading your portfolio across different right. different businesses. So the oil situation is actually changing because of the fact that dependency on oil has decreased. The U.S. is now the largest producer of oil, mm -hmm. so there is less dependency on the uh, on the Gulf oil from the U.S., but also from China, there's still dependency. So, so some of these stuff are actually changing for the better, in my opinion. Um, and some countries are moving in the right direction. The, the other... So... For you to start a business, you actually need an ecosystem, and that ecosystem includes regulations and 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 the Middle East because of the fact of the massive wave of nationalist socialism, which is a combination of worst ideologies probably in the world, have has been dominated a lot in many countries in the region, including where I come from in Iraq. So they have pushed that made it a lot of anti-business policies, um, and even in Kurdistan where we operate, and and that's what we work with Atlas Network about. We actually have been looking at a lot of laws from the 60s and the 70s of the fact that you have to get signatures in every other department for you to to do that, and. Our goal is to move the registration from three months to three days. And that's now, so so in a way, we actually have to do a lot of work in really making the regulations. But uh, the third option, which is I think the most obvious one, is security. Is that in order for you to have prosperous businesses and investment ecosystems and stock markets, etc., you need to have security apparatus. And that's why when you look at kind of Middle East at large, you see the countries that are more secure, like the Gulf states, which has U.S. military bases, and they have kind of security contracts with the West. They have been able to have the eco investment ecosystem, and that's where you can see people from around the world investing in Dubai, investing in Saudi Arabia, because they can guarantee that the building is not going to be blown up in the next 10 minutes, uh, as in the case in some places. And that's why many people are worried to invest in Kurdistan, except the oil industry and the security industry complex. So there is... There needs to be more diversification as more security comes in. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the origin story of Ideas Beyond Borders. You mentioned before, uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, it was founded in 2017. 
one of the um, main things that you do or what you started out doing was taking um, texts written by people like Sam Harris and Steve Pinker, translating them into Arabic and then uh, distributing them for free as eBooks. What, what was the thinking behind that? So the thinking behind it is that if, if I mean, uh, growing up in the Arabic internet and the Arabic ecosystem on, on the information ecosystem, if you go to uh, a bookstore in Jordan right now, when you see some of the featured bookstores are Mein Kampf, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and the Communist book, the, the, uh, the Communist Manifesto, uh, which are great books. <laughs> um, so, so if you look at the information ecosystem, and that's actually the way it tells you the history of waves in the Middle East. I mean, mm-hmm. Nazism and fascism and, and communism being in the center of the world has made it, made it a place that many of these ideologists are in. And what, was, what is unavailable was the values of freedom, which is the values of of, of classical liberalism, uh, of critical thinking, of science. So not only so when, when we look at this, like it was a very big challenge. I think the the Google research was like only zero point five percent of content is available in Arabic. One of the biggest challenges we actually faced at the beginning, and we're still facing in some languages other than Arabic, is that there is actually no vocabulary for freedom. So the, the, the economic terminologies that exist in Hayek or exist in Adam Smith and exist in most of the works are actually not available in the language because there has not been a lot of literature. So one of the things we actually had to create, and now we institutionalize it, we actually just hired an economist studying um, economy in Germany, but he's from Syria, is actually inventing some of the words that need to exist for wow. s- spreading the, the... So so there is the element of actually making the glossary and the uh, knowledge, of, uh, like the words available... And the other thing is actually making them accessible. And, and that's where, where the ebooks come in. In fact, I would say our most successful enterprise, which I think now is, is the larger program, is, as, because we, we started with the books. And then in order for us to, to go through, like we always we build the programs, we always think about it. How can we have enough that we don't need to do any, the work anymore? It's like, what is the tipping point? And we, we started with Wikipedia as well. So we translated about 40,000 articles. And now if you go to artificial intelligence, you will see that many of the terminologies that we actually helped translate mm-hmm. in the open source are now available on the artificial intelligence yeah, because we actually fed can, that. Can you talk about in Wikipedia, uh, you've translated about 40,000 articles. Maybe more by now, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, in Arabic, so before that, Arabic Wikipedia just ha- didn't have that much content or that much content about kind of liberal economic and political ideas. Yes. And most of what was available actually was kind of a biased uh, history, Islamic history and things of that sort, a very specific version. Uh, some of it was actually funded by states, and there was an article on that that they discovered that some of the Wikipedia articles were actually state-funded of people who wanted to push a certain narrative. So then we actually had to really kind of start from scratch in most mm-hmm. cases of really looking at, oh, the wealth of nations, there's nothing. And then you have to create it all from scratch, creating the right, uh, right glossary and, and indexing it correctly. And the idea is that that is a place where I mean, Wikipedia, if you search on Google, it's going to be the first thing that appears. So now finally, the Arabic internet actually looks normal. Yeah. When you search for something, it's, there's, you can actually find the thing you are looking for on the first thing, not like an article from Al Jazeera saying Adam Smith was like a Zionist agent or something like that. Mm. And then it was like, this is the, the first. So now it was like, we're actually making the internet, the Arabic internet look yeah. normal like any other country in the world. Is it, um, is it hard to access the internet uh, depending on the country? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so, so the most extreme uh, is Yemen. Um, and that is because there is very little infrastructure of internet and, and also the fact like constant wars. So that's the most difficult. Iran has one of the highest censorship regimes with the still like terms and conditions. I think what it's, um, the rest of the region is like, it depends. Syria, I think, is also on the list of kind of the worst. We get one of the things when we designed our uh, organization with the help of, of Google, actually, Jigsaw, uh, they have a way in which you can mirror the websites like 20 different servers. Mm-hmm. And if it's got banned in a certain country, they switch in a different IP address so it can still be accessed in that banned country. So in that way, we are able to like be available even when we are censored. Um, so we're actually kind of bypass some of that. That being said, there is the digital element, but there's also the physical elements. And I think that's where like places like Iran, is like even if sometimes you read a Stephen Binker book or you're, you're viewed by the government as you can actually obviously read the Stephen Pinker book in your bedroom, but if you are somebody watches you from the besiege or from the IRGC, then they want to get into trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's where like 
there's an element of physical security when you actually download some of that content or print it. So there's that's where things get a bit messy. And you use a, a is it dozens or hundreds of translators or people who are in the countries that we're talking about actually translating and doing this work? Yes. So and that's and that's really our. Uh, model I always say is like if it costs five hundred dollars to be a member of Al Qaeda, it should be five hundred dollars to translate liberalism. Mm. <laughs> so, so we actually yeah. want to create a business model for like if, if extremists have their business and the funding. For those of us who actually believe in peace and liberalism should actually also make it like mm. create create a business model for us to survive. And and so in a way, it's like our reason why we we support there in the Middle East is not only because it's cheaper, obviously it is cheaper, but also to actually support the region there for them to have agency to fight for these values and really support them in doing so. Who, who are the people who work for you? Obviously not, you know, with any identifying details, but what draws somebody to want to be part of this project if they're living in Syria or Lebanon or Iraq? So, so the great thing of, of what happened, like especially I think in 2017 in particular, is that I mean our fo- policy is that we don't reinvent the wheel. So we're always uh, we're, think of us as also a talent organization, not mm-hmm. just. Uh, and we try. So my first course of action is actually identify other groups that are doing this, and I found that there were actually massive efforts already existing of doing translation. One of them is called I Believe in Science, like kind of the National Geographic of the Arab world, has 4.5 million followers. We acquired them, one of the first things. So like one of the deals I made, sounds like a mafia deal to some extent, is that I brought many of the leaders of this kind of initiatives, underground or overground. I was like, listen, there's been all these efforts that that has never been institutionalized. And I think what we can do together is like IBB can be the institution for these values. So many of these people have already launched these efforts. So what we did is that, so when we went from like zero to where we are right now with 8.5, is actually a lot of it is acquisition and growth with these people. So many of of these people, I mean, I can talk talk more about the context of how all that happened, but we are, I would say, part of the third wave. So like people have tried communism, they have tried theocracy and they tried socialism, and they're looking for an alternative. And we are that alternative. Where I wouldn't want to exaggerate in saying like, oh, we are the number one. There is a lot of work to be done, but I think I'm I'm willing to fight it. Uh, would you? Thank you? Could you talk a little bit about those successive waves of you know the Middle East was carved up by colonial powers, by European powers, uh, as well as the Turks and whatnot. Uh, and then in the 20th century, I mean, everywhere there there came a wave of kind of nationalist. Uh, fervor, and that often took either a fascistic or a communist flavoring. What um, you know? What what were the motive forces in the Middle East that kind of turned it one way or the other? So I'm gonna give like the the 30 seconds version. But speaking of the Turks, I was actually in a in a in a debate or like discussion at NYU, and they said that Turks were not colonial because they were not white. So so I guess <laughs> we should not yeah. include the Turks in the list of colonialism right. colonialist forces. Just 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 joking. I'm so, not sure that the Belgians are white either. <laughs> that's true. Know, so. um, maybe their beer is white, yeah. but not yeah. but not them personally. Yeah. So um, yes, yeah, so I, I actually obviously add the Turks to the list of colonial yeah. forces. So. Um, I would say after the, I mean, not to go back too much in history, but after Turkey or Ottoman Empire lost World War I, there were two, the main question was for the Arab world, and there's so many, there's a book called The Arabs that explain that in detail, but the question is like, why did we fail? What actually happened that explains that failure in which us going back in history in which you used to occupy literally half of the planet all the way to southern Spain to Central Asia in which the the Arabic and the Islamic world used to be a world of conquest. It used to be taken over over the planet. And suddenly now we are colonized by the British and the French and others and where our borders are being divided by these colonial forces. So this is, I would say, the mentality of the Arabs. I studied that Saddam Hussein. That's how we were brainwashed this from the beginning, is that we were great and we got screwed over. And this, the answer to this question, the most two important waves, are the nationalists. And the nationalists, which is actually a combination of multiple thinkers and intellectuals, some of them are, are Christians from Lebanon, who are like, we failed because we were not united enough on race. So the reason why we're Arabs did not stand, stood up mm. for each other. 
and we got screwed over by and, the outsiders. And this means Arabs, you know, from Morocco all to, the way through oh, Iraq. To Iraq. Iraq. So it was yeah. like, we got screwed over. Uh, so we were united because Arabs did not stand up for each other and we allowed e each other to lose. And that's where like people like Michel Aflaq and eventually that got into the Ba'ath Party and the Nasserist movement. And this is like all the pan-Arab nationalists, which right. is which is a combination of, of really nationalism with a Soviet dose of socialism and national socialism. That's one thing. The other movement was we failed because we were not religious enough. And that's where came in the Muslim Brotherhood and all of the, what's sometimes called the Islamic Islamist movement or the political Islamic movement, is that we failed because we were not religious enough. And the best way for us is to be united under the one religion hmm. and create a theocracy and build on Islamic law. That obviously has not happened and eventually created the variations we saw today of ISIS and other and Hamas and other of these kind of more violent political and, forces. And that is, um, I mean, if the first, the pan-Arab movement just based on, you know, the idea that Moroccans and Iraqis have a lot in common, right? And they should share the same vision and the yeah. same and the same and and the same leaders. But then with the religious aspect you're talking, I mean, there are major divisions within Sunni Islam, much less Shia and Sunni Islam. Uh, and you, you just explained why these ideas is felt. <laughs> mm. um, is that when you go to the details, yes, there is like uh, very like the Moroccans. In fact, even the dialect of Morocco is actually very different than the dialect of Iraq. So it's mm -hmm. it's very hard for us to understand each other. Leave aside, right. but obviously there is a common culture and a common kind of theme. And many of these, f and but how something to be actually interesting about these movements, they're also kind of hybrid. So you can also have like when when I grew up, Saddam Hussein, he started as a secular leader, Arab mm -hmm. national secularist leader, but he actually switched to being a theocrat after he lost to America in, in mm -hmm. 1991. He's like, oh, Arab nationalism did not work because the Arabs have screwed me over and now oil, Kuwait screwed me over, yeah. Saudi. So now he moved into religion and then he built, like, uh, wrote the Quran with his own blood yeah. and, and then he became the descendant of Prophet Muhammad and then the rest is history. So so some of these um, yeah, forces are actually... work out so well. I haven't heard from Saddam lately. No, I mean... I mean I, I mean, some people yeah. still believe he's alive. So yeah. maybe I'm the representation of Sudan. I, I was, uh, you know, when the th when it came out that he had written the Quran in his own blood or had added <laughs> his blood to the vat. Um, I was talking about this earlier with some people. Kiss, the rock band Kiss oh, did that with Marvel Comics in the 1970s. So it was like he was a little bit late to that game. Yeah. No, because uh, they I mean, printed a comic book. In he he censored the internet and radio. So maybe he was not hearing it. Yeah. Um, so, um, so nationalism fell. I mean, it was a kind of post, you know, I mean, it helped create the post-colonial period because the Arab countries did get independence, but then the pan-Arab movement under Nasser in particular did not work. Um, how, you know, how is the theocratic project going? Because it obviously, parts of the Middle East are still, you know, very, very hyper-religious, not all of them, but... You know, is, you know, I don't want to say is that failing. It seems kind of self evident that it's not creating a unified Arab world or a unified Islamic world. But, um, you know, what, what do you think is going to happen next in terms of, you know, the theocracies in the Middle East? Um, well, I mean, in the most important year, I think, in the modern Middle East is 1979. And that's when the Ayatollah Khamenei. To call, or Khomeini actually took over the mm -hmm. uh, an overthrow of the Shah, and that was in a way a very success moment for the Islamic st uh, Islamic movements. There was, was also the, a siege of Mecca. The siege, well, of, exactly. Right? So yeah. on on the Shia side of things, it was the overthrow of the Shah. On the Sunni side of things, was the siege of Mecca by the Wahhab, kind of the Wahhabi elements. Uh, so that's what I would say they had kind of the peak where, and, and the Ayatollah Khomeini at the time was an inspiration for a lot of other voices in which, okay, if Iran can do it, we can do it as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, slowly some of that took, took kind of a more microcosm, like in the case of Lebanon in which Hezbollah and Harakat Amel, mm -hmm. which is the kind of the nonviolent element of that ideology rose up. So that's on the Lebanon context. And then in, in Gaza or, or Palestine, there was the, the, the Hamas movement. So, so I would say it's like the, biggest start was was the Iranian revolution because and also the Iranian revolution created a reaction from the Sunni side so because the 
Iran built up this the kind of successful example of Shia theocracy, the Sunnis were like, oh, number one, feeling afraid because she, Iran is an expansionist country. So then the Sunni states, including Saudi Arabia, were funding all of these extremist movements as a way to counter Shia expansionism, in addition to the Cold War politics of funding anti-Soviets in Afghanistan and things of that sort. So in a way, it's like the Iranian revolution stood up, then all of these extremist Sunnis came in as a as a way to react to that and then it created most of the challenges we actually face today and obviously i'm one of the schools who's fighting to make sure this uh, uh, groups fail uh, so so that's that's i would say as uh, a life mission and my goal is like to make sure that this is the last war lebanon has because yeah. it's it's a country that 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 needs that this actually these forces like the forces of of theocracy that came from iran do not represent the majority of the Lebanese will and the Lebanese mm. people. So I think that we actually can defeat these voices if we have enough will and we have enough support. But you uh, have talked in various places about kind of the liberal minority in places like Lebanon and whatnot. Who are they and you know how many troops do they have? And uh, you know <laughs> how do they, I mean, how does that build out a world? Uh, because some of the first books that you translated into Arabic were about secular governance and things and, and things like science, which has to be free of kind of religious dictates. This is something that Europe went through, you know, hundreds of years ago. But um, who are the liberals in Lebanon and other parts of the Middle East? And how, how do you grow their numbers? So the good thing about Lebanon is that they have had for a long time a culture that allowed a sense of freedom of expression and, 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 and creativity. So they're not the easiest place to work in, but also not the hardest. There are some places in the region where we also work where it's actually much harder. Um, the problem that liberals have to some extent is that we don't have a militia. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when, when all of the all of the other groups like, uh, like Hezbollah and, and others, when and, and that's actually what makes it really difficult uh, to, to be outspoken um, in, in some of these places, is that many of these militias, at the beginning, they send you a letter, which is a death threat, and then they try to kill you. So, so the thing is, like, that created a weakness that I think a lot of the liberal voices, liberal voices have, is that they don't actually have a backing. And, and there is actually a very famous uh, Lebanese uh, comedian who said, well, the Sunnis have Saudi Arabia and the Shias have, have Iran, but the liberals have nobody but God. Hmm. Uh, and, and the joke is like there's nobody supporting the liberals yeah. because if you are a Sunni militia, if I was from a Sunni extremist faction or Shia extremist faction, I can go on a meeting in Tehran and raise $10 million and get AK-47s hmm. and build up what Hezbollah did, an entire infrastructure, entire... But if I was a liberal... And now with, I mean, they actually have nobody else to support them. Mm. And, and that's, I think, what makes them weak. However, now with the fall, or now called the fall, I don't want to be too optimistic on that note, but with the weakening of Hezbollah, to be, to be mm -hmm. clear, now with the killing of the leader of, of the charismatic leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, who was a very, like he had a talk every Friday, and most people in the region watch that talk. Now that he's gone, now there's actually a lot of momentum as Hezbollah is busy restructuring that many of these liberal voices are actually coming out. Uh, which were not the case before when the Hezbollah was more powerful. And in Iraq, we actually had our biggest wave in 2019 called the Tishreen movements, where finally that liberal voices got actually get institutionalized. It was a bunch of voices, bloggers and, and, and people spoken on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But then after the, the Tishreen movement, we figured out that it's actually not enough just to talk on Facebook or, or to talk about it. Actually, it's time for us to institutionalized and built political coalition. And I think as of now, the liberal coalition has roughly about 20 to 24 members of the Iraqi parliament mm. uh, that, that support to some extent free enterprise. Of course, we're going against a massive wave of pro-Iranian parties and things mm. like that. But slowly but surely, the institutionalization of liberal ideas is finally coming, um, which was not the case for the past 40 years. Does, um, does it help or hurt that the United States is not in the in the region like it used to be. Well, that's a that's a big question. Um, so, the, does it hurt if the U.S. withdraws? The answer is yes, um, because of the fact if the U.S. does not exist, somebody else is going to fill that vacuum, and it's going to when you're dealing with kind of three, four major powers, if we include Iran being one then if, if the U.S. withdraws, somebody else is, is, is doing that. That being said, there is, and, and back to kind of the Kurdistan example, is that there is 
a good intervention and a bad intervention. So when, when the thing with, with the Kurdistan situation is that there was, a, and even the first Gulf War itself, it had a very specific mission, which is removing Saddam from Kuwait and then, uh, and then creating a no-fly zone for the Kurds for them to flourish. The problem with the Iraq War was it started with weapons of mass destruction, change into nation building, then it became more on terrorism, then I don't know what the fuck happened, and then they withdrawn. So that is really the story of the Iraq War as I lived it. It was mm -hmm. like the, the, the combination of really changing missions as, as we go, which created a very bad intervention. And then in the case of Afghanistan, the U.S. has spent $3 trillion in Afghanistan to replace the Taliban with the Taliban. Right. So this is this is another failed intervention where we, I mean, it might be in the case of if the U.S. would have stayed in Afghanistan, we would have less likely to prevent it. And I think... However, I mean, there is definitely a conversation to be had between a good intervention and a back intervention. I think the war in Iraq in, in particular has backfired because now there's very little trust in the U.S. As, a, as an institution. In fact, if the U.S. did the Iraq war better, now the case against supporting distant voices against Shah al-Assad or distant voices against the Ayatollah. I mean, when I go to Washington, D.C. and I talk to State Department and others, they, they have what I call the Iraq syndrome. It's like, we interfered in there, it failed. We're not going to support anybody else in the Middle East. It's over. It's a lost subject. And the thing is like, but the, the, that's what I say, like the Middle East is always like a series of missed opportunities hmm. because now we're seeing a lot of people are fighting for freedom and now we're saying, no, we're not doing anything because we failed in one place. And I guess it's more complicated than that too, right? Because when you mention Iran, it, you know, the United States and certainly Britain were implicated in the coup in 1953. That brought the Shah into power and whatnot. So it kind of de depends on when you say, okay, this is when history begins, and and, um, and also whether or not you you have a good or bad reputation. So one area. thing to add is like most of the U.S. intervention, if you want to call it U.S. intervention, is actually protecting trade routes. So most of like, I mean, there's the U.S. intervention we see it in through of wars and things like that. But if you look at most of the trade that actually goes through the Gulf and the and we call it the Arab Sea, but they call it the Persian Sea. Some people that's well, that's a conflict that's always going to exist. But yeah. the so mo actually a lot of U.S. presence, which is U.S. military bases in the Gulf, they don't necessarily engage in warfare. They're actually do there to to protect some of these places, but also in agreement with the regions there, but also to protect trade routes. So not all intervention is actually, unfortunately, the one that gets the most media and sometimes the one that the U.S. spends the most on is actually the wars that, that eventually backfires. And and case of Iran is also a bit more complicated because no. because uh, that was during the Cold War and, and uh, Mossadegh was also pro-Soviet. So, so he was a victim of the kind of the Cold War mentality of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, and I mean, not to uh, stay on this too long, but I mean, the U.S supports Israel, it supports Egypt, it supports Jordan, UAE, Saudi Arabia. Like, So have we really left the region? No. Uh, and, no. Uh, which is, I think it's, I, I always like, to, I mean, if we're going to engage in this theoretical conversation, it's always good to imagine the world without the U.S. intervention. Um, and I think it's going to be most likely, especially, like, I mean, Israel's conversation is obviously complicated but if you look at like kind of the gulf states like the uae and saudi etc if there is no one if iran would actually try to attack aramco right now which is one of the largest oil oil companies then you're actually going to make the whole saudi economy dysfunctional it can destroy the entire not the entire energy routes but a significant amount so in a way it's like we also have to look at the cost of non-intervening and i think it i, I see that the cost benefit analysis is that good interventions, which I think could be an entire seven book series written on what they, what they sound mm -hmm. like, could actually be much more better, better than non-interventions because somebody else is going to... That being said, actually, I do, because I hear, I know we're in a liberal or classical liberal crowd. I would argue that part of the reason why the Abrahamic Accords happened is the U.S. withdrawal from the region. So in a mm -hmm. way is that part of the reason why the Abrahamic Accords actually in the UAE and, Saudi, and, and not Saudi Arabia, UAE and, right. and Israel signed the deal was kind of the realization under the Obama administration and to a large extent under the Trump administration because Aramco was attacked during the Trump administration and, and Trump's response was, this is not an American military base, we're not here to protect you. So it's your, mm -hmm. you're under this. So the Saudis get the hints, okay, the US is not withdraw is withdrawing. They saw that Russia is intervening in Syria and successfully protected Assad. Then they're like, okay, so now we're already living in a post-US world. 
And they were like, okay, so we have Israel. We might not like them that much. But they hit the Iranians. And we have a much more better deals for us as a region to build regional integration with Israel as part of it than for us to to be eventually be attacked by Iran and have nobody else to defend us. So in a way, it's like somebody can argue it both ways is that to some extent, when the U.S. withdraws, people in the region take more agency and some good Run. things happen, in my opinion, like the Abrahamic Accords that enhances economic integration, economic collaboration, and it's good for everybody. But but at the same time, we don't know yet if, if the U.S. fully withdraws, which is not, not the no. case anymore, uh, what will happen. Do you think the Hamas attacks from a year ago on Israel, obviously, uh, you know, a, an attempt to disrupt any kind of growing accords between Israel and other uh, countries in the region, has that derailed things completely or does it just change the timetable of new regional, um, you know, kind of agreements between Israel and Saudi Arabia, UAE, et cetera, coming on to, uh, you know, coming into being? Well, what day is it? Uh, let me yeah. see if I'm optimistic. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, the answer is yes, it has derailed. I mean, I, I think a significant reason why the October 7th attack happened was to derail the Saudi-Israel uh, normalization. I, I, and, and even the, the uh, New York Times actually revealed some of the Sinwar's documents of why he did October 7th. That they recently found out, and they found that this is one of the reasons. Of course, not, not the main reason, but was a veto power that Hamas had, which is like, this is our chance to, and there was an interview that actually Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, did on Fox two weeks before, before October 7th. What she was saying about, oh, we're getting closer, mm -hmm. normalization is going closer. And there were some kind of conditions that Saudi has put for the normalization to happen, um, which was, number one, and, and it's very similar to actually other Abrahamic Accords when you look at the details. So with Morocco... Morocco wanted the United States to recognize the Great Sahara as part of Morocco, and, mm -hmm. and Trump actually recognized the Great Sahara as part of Morocco, and then there was the deal. In the case of Saudi, there were a couple of conditions. One is that they wanted more F-16s. The other one, they wanted the nuclear powers uh, to have to replace the reliance on coal and oil. And the third one was a creation of a Palestinian state because they were afraid that if, if, it's, if the status quo is there and they, they normalize or make a deals with Israel, they're going to be an internal revolution against them or from the other parts of the region. It's like, okay, you gave up too easily. Mm -hmm. You let the Israelis do it without Palestinian existence. And then they were afraid of... Assa and, and now it's like recently that I think MBS sent a letter to the Congress saying he's afraid of assassination because even the media right now, even the Saudi media, and, and, and I actually did... I'm going to publish an article doing a review of the Arab media one year after October 7th. And actually... A significant amount of the media by the UAE and Saudi Arabia and, and the other Arab states are actually mostly critical of October 7th. They think it was an absolute failure, it accomplished nothing, and really, I mean, look at Gaza before, now it's like we're discussing with Israel a return to day before October 7th. Forget about the borders of 1967 or 1948 or all the UN resolutions. We're actually discussing, can we go back to October 6th? So that's like the more, the most actually common theme if you watch Al Arabiya and 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 Meshhad and many of the channels in the Arab world. So there's a great disappointment. I think hopefully that disappointment can turn to something positive and 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 the and the integration can happen. But I definitely without quoting quoting I say is that at least the Abrahamic Accords are delayed between five to ten years. Yeah. Um and for anything to actually go back to October six. Like mm -hmm. for us to go back to I, I remember I was in the United Arab Emirates a year before October 7th, I was there in 22, and it was an event about October 7th, and, and uh, no, sorry, event about, <laughs> about Abraham Accords. And there was the ministers from the UAE, and, mm. and, and even Israel, and, and tech companies from Israel, and AI, and BI technology, and all of that. And they were all celebrating the fact that, oh, we're going to have UAE investors coming to Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv people partying in Dubai, and all of that stuff. And now, there was actually, uh, I think, a report from the Abrahamic Accords Institute, which I think based in London. Most of these people who actually joined these meetings refused to be invited to any meeting about Abrahamic Accords. So actually, they have 0% retention rate, uh, which tells you that the mood is actually very low. As, 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 uh, so I, I, I would say it's like even with, with like, if there's a magic wand, that will make it five years. But, but if there is... Um, things go the way they are, it's probably going to take 5, 10, and, and who knows, the Middle East is an ongoing living organism. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned the Taliban uh, a little while ago. One of the other things that IBB does is fund schools for I'm girls go, yep. now. Can you talk a little bit about that and how do how do they operate in a new you know in in a new Taliban Afghanistan? So that that's I would say like one of innovative but really interesting and sometimes sad story is that after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Taliban came back, as you know, and one of the things they instituted was that women cannot continue higher education. So as a result, some of the professors and teachers who for the first time went to study, went to class during the U.S. intervention because their parents were not never been to, to college were like, OK, we don't want to uh, the, the girls today to face what our parents have faced. So they started kind of like an underground movement of people donating their houses and the teachers going to these houses, c continuing the education for these girls. Um, and I got to actually know the story from the uh, Deutsche Welle, which is the German, the German channel, and th the journalist was like, I don't want to give you all the details, but I actually just discovered this, which is like I'm meeting with a group of teachers who are doing this underground work, which I think could be very aligned with your organization and education and things like that. So like, OK, like this is sounds too good to be true. And I was like, I don't want to end up on the U.S. government watch list for for supporting the wrong people. And then we actually had multiple vetting conversation to make sure they're real and we contact a lot of people. And yes, they are real. And we so we built up this pro special program for for them, that it's a combination of continuing education, but also vocational and, and digital training. So for them, they can kept, like have skill sets like graphic design and things like that in which they can still function and work and get paid online. So in a way, there's some element of functional economy within that community. So it's a combination of multiple multiple things. It is on our website, you see IBB and then Underground Schools of Afghanistan for more details. Uh, is, is there any sense of... Um you know, and it, I mean, I guess the revolutions that actually change countries really come from within, including, and that's true of the Iranian revolution, uh, you know, that brought the Islamic Republic into being, as well as the eventually the revolution that topples it. But in, in Afghanistan, or, um, you know, is there... Is there an internal movement to replace the Taliban, or is that just not even, you know, worth thinking about right now? So when I first read about Afghanistan, I'm obviously one of the most famous statements is called the graveyard of empires. Hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, this is not true. Then I read it and I was like, oh, maybe. Uh, so the, 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 the issue, I mean, which brings us back to World War I and kind of the, hmm. the complex history of, of these nations is that I, I'm, I'm a believer that sometimes it's too, when it's too difficult to hold a nation together, maybe this nation should not exist as it is right now. And... I would definitely say that in the case of Afghanistan. I mean, the, and, and that might be a controversial opinion for some, but the, but the thing is that the Taliban is, yes, as, as a religious movement and, and they are theocrats, et cetera, but there also there is an ethnic element to the Taliban. They are Pashtuns, majority Pashtuns, and they feel that they are being discriminated against by the Tajiks, et cetera. So the thing is like, with the Tajik part of, of Afghanistan, there is a very famous leader, which was actually killed two days before 9-11. His name is Ahmed Shah Masood. And actually, Al-Qaeda killed him in, in, in Afghanistan. And now his son took some leadership to actually fight the Taliban right now. So there's actually a movement inside Afghanistan that is militarily fighting the, the, the Taliban in some areas in Panjshir and some parts of the northern parts. Um, the issue, so that's the good the good part is that this thing is happening. So there is obviously a movement of fighting. The good part is that, the bad part is that it's so difficult to create an inclusive government when you have traumas and things are building up over time. Okay, you killed my cousin, I killed your cousin. This idea of like going back together and singing Kumbaya mm. is not going to happen. I mean, you, would, you would expect it in a lot of other places. So I think... I think Afghanistan is part of that story is that there is a lot of work needs to be done of like really trying to figure out can actually this country exist as it is right now. Um, and I would say the, the ca same case, I mean, I mean, Joe Biden's famous argument about Iraq was that Iraq needed to be divided to three countries of Kurdistan and, and kind of Shiastan and Sunnistan. However, in Iraq, it's very complicated because Baghdad is actually a very inclusive multicultural city. So who, who, where would that go? But so there are some parts that are more difficult, and there's already a shared history and tradition, but there are some parts where there's more segregation. And, and so I think it's like 
to shortly answer your question is that yes, forces fighting the Taliban right now. I'm semi optimistic about them, but not fully optimistic. And I think there's more conversation to be done about can the country of Afghanistan exist as it is right now because it's unsustainable and there might be a way to kind of divide the country in which one part of it will be more liberal, kind of South Korea, North Korea situation. You have the North Korea being communist and South Korea being prosperous free society. And this situation and model could actually work in many of these areas. I think I speak for everyone when I say nobody wants to be in North Korea. I'm sure yeah. there's... Yeah. Um, uh, what, what was the the basketball player who went there? Yeah, Dennis Rodman. Yeah. Even yeah, he, he didn't wants stay. To be... <laughs> Even he didn't stay. Um, <laughs> uh, can I, you uh, you grew up in Baghdad? What year were you born? Uh, Nineteen ninety one. So uh, I mean, you you brought an American invasion uh, and and COVID. Talk and... talk about what it, what was it like growing up in Baghdad after um, you know Saddam was kicked out of Kuwait. So, I mean, in, in Iraqi terminology, I'm called a sanctions boy. So I was born during the sanctions, the U.S. sanctions on Iraq from 1991 until, until the war. So, I mean, I, I remember vividly, actually, the day of, of uh, the, the fall of Saddam Hussein, which uh, my older brother was upstairs. And then he was like, oh, there's a tank in front of our house. And then at the same time, downstairs, we're watching news saying that Americans are being defeated in Nasriya, which is in the south, and they're getting their ass kicked, and, and you look at these photos of the U.S. soldiers being being killed and kidnapped and all that stuff, which most of them end up being fake footage. It's actually not not real. But then it was like, my, my brother was like, there's literally like U.S. military in front of our house. And then within a couple of hours, my elementary school was a military base of the Iraqi army, and the U.S. bombed the elementary school, and then, and then we're like, oh, so the U.S. is actually in Iraq right now, in yeah. Baghdad. Yeah. Uh, within, so that was, I remember that night very well because it was like endless war between the, the two sides, the Iraqi army. And then I remember the next day, one of my brother friends came in like pretty much naked with like white, and he's like, I'm in the Iraqi army and all of us are resigning right now and the war is done, Saddam is gone. Hmm. And I still remember like, what? What are you talking about? Like Saddam? I remember like my mom and my dad who grew up their entire lives, most, almost, almost their entire lives in Saddam Hussein, they had like a major shock factor. Of, like, no. Are you like, really? Saddam Hussein, the guy that we always thought the most powerful and is like kicked out in like two weeks and after. Mm. Um, so that's, that's my first memory of the war, uh, which started, which, which ended in, in, in April 2003. Um, and then within, so within kind of, seven months so my neighborhood m my dad profession is he's an orthopedic surgeon so during saddam time and during socialist countries for those of you who grew up in there they actually the government sometimes design decides where the doctor should live and where so i was like oh the baghdad needs 10 months of orthopedics and 10 months of of that so my dad actually really killed it to baghdad and my neighborhood was a neighborhood where many of saddam hussein generals used to live in so our neighborhood within time switched from residential neighborhood into al-Mujahideen, which is actually eventually called al-Qaeda. Um, so we moved, our neighborhood moved from like a peaceful, to some extent peaceful, family-oriented uh, neighborhood to literally people who used to be pro-Saddam left the country to Jordan and to Qatar and all of the neighboring countries. And then most of the houses became empty. And then there were all these people coming in from like Chechnya and like old countries like Uzbekistan and I was even hearing Russian speaking in our country, our neighborhood and I was like what the hell so, so our neighborhood like moved from that to like Times Square of terrorism within <laughs> within like w months really um, so with that happening I mean how does that look like in practice was a lot of checkpoints that stop in the middle of the streets um, they're like kind of covered up and then they ask people whether they're Sunni and Shia and my case, I'm what considered the tradition of sushis. I'm a sushi. So actually, I grew up under the Sunni tradition uh, of, of Saddam Hussein, actually, because I studied under, and my name is traditionally Sunni name, but my mom is from Najaf, which is the holiest site of Shia Islam. So in a way, it's like identity crisis in building. Yeah. So, so, so my brother at the time had to create two other fake IDs because our last name is actually not good enough for people to know whether you're Sunni or Shia. So we actually had to create two fake IDs and all these checkpoints based on their flag and their, and, and you have to, they ask you, are you Sunni or Shia? And then you have to give them the right ID. And sometimes if they are skeptical, they ask you to pray 
in the front of and and then to check your to take your religion and then that's where was the start of the civil war. So and then the Sunnis and the Shias were killing each other. Fast forwards uh, and, and you can see actually my talk on also Freedom Forum where I talk about that in detail. But uh, fast forward like in 2007, back to the U.S. intervention, the U.S. launched something called the Surge, and my neighborhood was one of the areas that were affected by the Surge. So I grew up about one hour away from Fallujah, which is where the area where the most U.S. military were killed. So they were looking for, that was actually my first interaction with the war, where there was the surge and then the the group called the Sons of Iraq, and then there was the Iraqi government working this coalition, and I was this young boy translating between these three people, uh, and then like within a couple of years, I ended up on a death list, and, and here I am in Jonathan's apartment uh, <laughs> with the Reason magazine, so thank you. Um, with what um, your your parents were not believers in Saddam Hussein, and they were not particularly religious, right? So what, no, what was what was it like to grow up in a in a you know in an authoritarian state where you you know you had a supreme leader, but you kind of also knew that it was bullshit. Well, um, so I, I'm, I would say it's like with my parents in particular, the biggest feeling was disappointments. So my parents lived in Iraq where it was far more prosperous than under Saddam Hussein. And they both, my dad in particular, studied in the United Kingdom. So my dad actually went on a scholarship to Edinburgh University, and that's where he got his certificate of orthopedic surgery. And then when in the... In the 80s, he decided, oh, I wanna, now I'm educated, I wanna go back, fix my country. Now I have this great education, and now, and my mother is a lawyer, so I think she's a constitutional lawyer, and then civil law, and they, they were both like, let's go back to Iraq, seems like there is a great opportunity, and then within like two years, Saddam invades Kuwait, <laughs> and, and then they had sex, and I was born. So that's, that's no. my life, that, no. that's the first chapter was, of my biography. Yeah. Wow. Um, so shock and awe. Right? Shock and awe, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so um, the, uh, the my first, I would say, my first two experiences with authoritarianism was so I grew up under the sanctions post, I said post first mm -hmm. Gulf War. The United States and France had radio stations that they used to broadcast into Iraq during that period of time, and my dad who obviously was not a fan of Saddam Hussein and saw all of the, the bad economic policies and everything. Me and him used to actually wake up and listen to a, a channel called Monte Carlo, which is the French channel broadcasting into Iraq of like, oh, hey, we are former Ba'ath Party people and we think Saddam is evil and we ask people to rise up and all that. That's sometimes. And then there is a U.S. channel called Radio Sawa, which is part of the U.S. Agency for Global Media, which was like combination of like Western music into like some anything that's like Western, and they used to broadcast it. And then for Baghdad, it's a, it's a bit further from the borders. So we actually have to, it's later at night where you can actually get good signal versus like places like Basra and Kurdistan where they, are, they, had, they had better. So, so that was my first experience with authoritarianism was actually my dad saying that like, we, we actually had to be in hiding, listening to radio, and if everybody else watching us, that would be the end. And the other thing we noticed, which actually shows the corruption of authoritarianism, was that those of his friends who were Baathist and close to the regime had satellite television, they had BMWs and Mercedes. So like there were actually two realities of, of Iraq during Saddam Hussein, which is like there were those who were close to the regime who had really luxurious, to some extent, a free life. I mean, even when the internet was accessible, those people who were on the top were able to have internet and, and, and all of that. Well, those of us who, who did not have allegiance to the regime um, were screwed up. And so that's the other thing. The other kind of experience, which is, I would say was more daily, was like my parents kind of like the, the kind of educational talk, which is like everything we say in the house, especially if it was critical of Saddam Hussein, you should not say it outside the house. Because I was a kid and they're like, nothing said here should be, should be repeated. And the theory was one out of four adults is at the intelligence services. So you actually never know who, like, you could be talking to a friend or a cousin or a relative, and you don't know if they are actually going to report you. So that's, I would say, like, the two experiences that really, like, shape for me what live under authoritarianism. And then we hear, like, within a week after the war or two weeks, this guy fell. I was like, what? Like, this whole 
apparatus, this whole like demigod that used to have is like now gone. And, and obviously it was not fully gone because all the militias start coming out after in the Civil War. So what happened? Um, I guess uh, we're going to uh, do a few questions in a minute, but just to kind of wrap up, could you talk a little bit about, are you optimistic about the, the regions of the world that IBB operates in, uh, you know, the Middle East, Central Asia, uh, increasingly places like Iran? Um, you know, are you optimistic that, you know, does does freedom win, you know, inevitably or is it, you know, a lot of luck and a lot of work? I, or, you know, how, how do you feel about the, the next five years and the next 15 years? I mean, my dad always says we don't have the privilege to be depressed. So um, I actually don't have a choice but to, to be optimistic. I, I would say, I mean, I do have the bias that because of Ideas Beyond Borders and the work we do, I am connected to really people who are in the front lines who are fighting for freedom. So by default of really being always connected to people fighting for these values gives me a lot of, of optimism. And then, however, there's always externalities. I mean, I, I, I wrote an article on my Substack is that we as Arab liberals did not decide October 7th. We did not have any play in all of what's happening. And now, you know, like, in a way, we got screwed up in all of these external factors of, of Hezbollah firing rockets and then the liberal Lebanese having to be stuck in that situation within the war. So I, I think is that I'm, I'm very optimistic about some place in the Middle East. I would say Lebanon. There is a great opportunity right now of people really after removing of the head of Hezbollah. Hassan Nasrallah, there's a lot of people fighting and we're actually working a lot on that. Um, Iran, I'm... I'm I had optimism during the revolution. I'm less optimistic right now. I think the there is some agreement even within the Biden administration that we have to contain Iran. And one of my, I guess, contradictions about Iraq is that I don't think Iraq could have, Saddam could have been removed without military force. And I think the same about Iran. So I think the likelihood that the U.S. would do anything uh, with the current Biden administration is very unlikely. So I think Iran is going to stay as it is. Jordan and other, I'm optimistic about Saudi Arabia. There's a lot of movements towards economic liberalism and 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 others. So yeah, some regions are more optimistic than others. Um, but I think regardless of what we do, I mean, I'm, in America, it was not built in a day and there was a lot of work. Now all of these freedoms we take for granted as a result of a lot of people fighting for it. So I think I want to support those who want to build the freedom for their countries. Um, a final uh, word. One of the things that it's, you know, been interesting to see as IBB grows over time, the emphasis on economic self-determination and economic freedom. And you talk about how uh, running a business or, or having economic freedom really changes the mindset in terms of politics and culture. Can you just discuss that a little bit? Uh, and I love discussing that, is that when I was discussing all of these wars and conflicts and all that stuff, one of the things that they rob away from you is agency. What dictatorships do and what these conflicts do is that they take agency away from you. And while starting a business and going into innovating stuff that actually change people's lives and they are profitable and, and can grow is actually giving back the agency to these people. So one of the things that I do love about the whole free market, free enterprise model is that it gives people a lot of agency. And most importantly with, the, with innovation is that I mean, there's a great concept, concept called the brain drain, is that because of these, if the economic situation is not there, many of these talented people end up immigrating. So if they have agency and the situation is decent or relatively peaceful in their countries, they were more likely to stay that they're going to be in a refugee camp in Sweden. So we actually have to invest in these people because the future of these countries and the and, and development of this country is going to come from mostly from these innovators and the people who have took agency over themselves. All right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you, Faisal Said. Thank you so much. Of Ideas Beyond Borders.